today we're going to be talking about prisons and, industri and the industrial food processes that surround them. So I thought I'd lay it out in a quick kind of way where I'm going to throw out a couple of questions and do maybe a quick go around and see where people are at and how much knowledge they have of prison because it's going to dictate the rest of the conversation if you, have a, you know a lot or if you don't. Um, I'm going to introduce myself first. Uh, I'm Gabby and I've been going to a federal prison for the last 15 years as a volunteer once a week uh, in a male lifers group. And a lot of the information I'm going to talk about is actually informed by different prisoners that I've met across Quebec regarding food. So it's like really an inside perspective as well as law and different elements surrounding it. Um, prison is often like a mysterious thing because there's not a lot of information that gets out there. It's like a closed thing and a lot of the information that we get is often propaganda through media like the newspaper article that I handed out by the Toronto Sun in terms of what's going on inside and it sort of skews the perspective because uh, a lot of mass media often they work in conjunction with the state so often they're trying to promote the political agenda of the time and that's what we see in newspaper articles and it's hard to get an accurate picture of what goes on unless you're going inside often or if you're inside then you have the actual picture of what goes on so I'm gonna go over that a little bit um, we're gonna talk a little bit about how food is sourced in the US in prisons and how it's sourced in Canada there's differences in where they get their food uh, and like I said I'm gonna talk about Canada but I'm talking more specifically about Quebec because that's what I'm more familiar with when you look through research, you're not going to find much research on this. They don't really talk about it. They talk in very general terms. Uh, if you go online, you'll, you'll find information on the Correctional Services of Canada site in terms of what their stand is on food and how they regulate that. But you're not going to get, like, it's a very general. So it's hard to get information on this unless the only way to do it, basically, is to talk to people inside and figure out what actually goes on in the day-to-day -day regarding food processes. We're going to talk a little bit too about how the law interacts or not with the food, with prison food. And we're going to end off a little bit talking about, uh, welcome. Hi. Hi. I'm actually not sure what's happening here, but I have like some things to do, so I'm just going Okay, to it's fine. We're just having a little workshop, but that's fine. Okay. Uh, and the last thing I'm going to talk a bit about food and prison resistance. How is food used in resistance? So before I, I handed out this article because this is like a prime example of stuff that's often published about prisons. And uh, I thought I'd start off by just asking, throwing around a couple of questions and maybe doing a go around if you feel comfortable of where you're at and how you've conceived of prison and food and their connection. So. I'm obviously coming from a critical perspective. I, I'm critical of the prison system and what goes on and I'm often skeptical when I read things and I try to analyze. And I gave you this because I'm going to try to deconstruct it with what I believe actually goes on and what's being alleged in the article. So some of the questions to think about quickly is how do you conceive of prison? Why do we have prisons? What are they there for? Uh, are they used for punishment or are they used for rehabilitation? What I mean is like when someone commits an act of wrong, they're put inside. Do we put them inside because we want, them, we want them to improve their behavior and become people in society that can function without committing crimes? Or is it because we want to punish them because they've done something wrong? Uh, and also, is food, do you think food should be part of that punishment. Should we punish through food? Bad quality food, lack of food, etc. So maybe we could do a little go around whoever feels comfortable to say what do you know about prison in general? Uh, why are you interested? And what you conceive of the purpose? Does that make sense? Yeah. So you can answer to any of those or none of those, but like if you've thought about it, why do you think we have prisons 
in your mind? I would guess that we have prisons to house uh, what society would deem to be undesirables. I think that there is definitely punishing going on like beyond uh, rehabilitation and I think it's quite obvious that it's also uh, treated as an economic problem on, in many ways and I think that that's probably reflected in, in how the food uh, is served. What do you mean an economic problem? Just like I think that they're looking, they're not just looking, like you can see it right here, you know, yeah. they're, they're talking about how they're paying $312 per prisoner per day mm -hmm. and like looking, like reducing these very personal issues to mere numbers. Like that's distracting from a lot of the um, experiences that people would have. Yeah. yeah, I think that you can't just treat it as a numbers problem. Okay. And I know that there's a huge industry around mm. incarcerating people. I'm like vaguely familiar with like the prison industrial complex, like Angela yeah. Davis. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. And uh, Vice Magazine recently did a little thing about prison food. And oh, did they? Yeah, they did. Okay, and what was their just quick? Oh, uh, they were just talking about how horrible it was. Yeah. And it how um, inmates are trying to be creative and how they can like make their food slightly better. Or, I'm going to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, because obviously it's a short rotation, and yeah, I think that uh, definitely food is a very like uh, central, fundamental thing for people. I don't oh, think yeah. people should ever be forced to eat bad food. <laughs> You want to add anything? You don't have to. No, it's fine. Um, I don't know much about prisons. I, from what I know, like I don't know any. Let's say I don't know about any facts based upon you know like food and food buying. I know that there was a lot of privatization involved mm -hmm. with uh, certain prisons right. in the U.S. and like some in Canada. Like there's negotiations and there's plans on you know there for there to have private interest in prisons mm -hmm. where. Inmates would create um, uh, create wealth for the state, mm. and I think that's problematic. And it's reflected. You, you will be able to see like that kind of reflected in the food that they're being served, and that a lot of the food services probably that are inside are in cahoots with the government. So I find that really interesting. I don't know much about it, but I like I've read a little bit. Well, I'll talk a bit about my experience and what I know about it. And really, if you want to talk about anything else or you have any other ideas, like just jump in and we can have a conversation. Like it's not set in stone that I need to talk about everything I said I would. Mm -hmm. If you find something interesting you want to go into more detail, I don't have a problem at all. Whatever I know about it doesn't mean I'll know. But I thought I'd start a bit about like recently what I saw was an article in the newspaper that said, not this one, but another one that said something that uh, there was outrage in the community because prisoners were being served pudding made from powder, right? And how they get better food than kids in public schools or folks in nursing homes. There's always this comparison that like food in prison, oh look, they're eating a cake, it's someone's birthday, wow, you don't even get that in nursing home. Like there's, all, there's often a comparison between prison and in other places that have industrial food processes where they're com they have food on a large scale and to me what struck me with this article was sort of like okay yeah prisoners do get pudding with powder i don't know if school cafeterias do or nursing homes i don't know but them getting this the question shouldn't be why are prisoners getting this and why are old age homes and cafeterias not get the question i think is that the concept is kind of screwy and it says more about the bad conditions surrounding food in general in our mass world of mass production than it does about prisoners being fed really well you know so they always skew this question they always use prisons as a sounding board to compare to other areas as opposed to saying why don't we serve better quality food in nursing homes and cafeterias and prisons? So they always use prison as the sounding board, like prisoners are getting a special privilege of eating this wonderful powdered pudding, which I think is kind of ridiculous, because I don't think powdered pudding is very good. But there's often this kind of propaganda going over things, you know, where they'll, be, they'll show someone eating cake and saying, wow, prisoners get cake, but, our elderly don't, you know, like it's always this kind of comparison thing, which I find really weird. 
they're asking the wrong questions. But I think it's purposeful because I think when there's a political agenda, right now we live in uh, um, in Canada, Harper's getting tough on crime agenda. And we have to, when we read articles, when we, we have to realize that if it's mass media, that whatever the article is, it's going to complement that agenda. And that's why we get all these things about like, oh, prisoners eat so well and our, we're letting our old elderly eat nothing, you know, like there's always this kind of thing, which is completely inaccurate because they follow the same mass production food processes, these places. So this article is a really right-wing extreme article, and I realize that, that it's because uh, the Toronto Sun is known for like really being right wing and anti prisoner and stuff like that. And what I found interesting is I thought maybe I could use it and deconstruct some of the fallacies in the article because there's a lot of inaccuracies and the way they present the picture is not accurate at all. So maybe I'll read just the first half page to give the flavor of it and then I'll break down what I what infuriates me about this article. Okay, so it's called Canada's Criminal Sitting Pretty as Price Tag for Prisoners Soar. So it starts, retire at 65, a life of honest work behind you and the Canada Pension Plan will fork over a maximum of $11,840 annually to supposedly keep you fed, clothed and sheltered. Land in bed, uh, land a bed in jail via rape, murder or any other heinous criminal act and you're suddenly worth $113,974 a year to the federal government, nearly 10 times as much. Fair? Hardly. But that's the annual cost of keeping an inmate incarcerated in Canada, according to the latest report from Corrections Canada. It means the federal government is paying $312 per prisoner per day to keep Canada's worst citizens healthy, happy, and secure in the penitentiary our killers and cretins chose to live in and choose is the key term for those who end up behind bars in this country, living at the taxpayer's expense in institutions that by most accounts are nicer than most nursing homes in Canada. No one made them live in jail, and yet the crooks are treated as guests on the federal government dime. Free healthcare, recreation, dental, entertainment, education, libraries, and so forth. The amenities for those who surrender their freedom is well documented and very expensive. Linen and furniture for cells add up to 1.7 million alone, according to an Auditor General's report for a couple of, from a couple of years ago, while the daily menu, yes, menu, was worth nearly $10 per day per prisoner. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there. We all know what direction this article is taking. And it's completely misleading and is based on assumptions that are incorrect. So I'm going to start off by the $113,974 per prisoner. When we say this kind of stuff, and I hear people complain about that all the time in everyday life, like people I meet, and you know, we're spending, taxpayers pay a hundred and, you know, 20000 a year per prisoner, and I can't believe we put money in this and all this kind of stuff. Well, that's incorrect. We don't pay that for the prisoner. What that goes to most of it is to the apparatuses that surround the criminal justice system in general, the labor. So you got, you know, you're paying, you, it creates a false impression that all this money is being spent on this prisoner and the prisoner is leaving a life of luxury. $312 a day is being spent for food and entertainment and this kind of stuff. But it's not. Most of it goes back into the system and it pays the staff that creates the industrial complex of crime prevention and criminal justice and all that kind of stuff. They have corrections officers, unit officers, psychologists, psychiatrists, keepers, courts, probation. They have all these things and that's what costs. What actually is being spent on the prisoner is very minimal in the grand scheme of things. So. I'm going to get into how much they pay for food and all that kind of stuff, how much is spent on that a little later. But this whole concept is like 
kind of skewed because the article is sort of saying, oh my gosh, we're spending so much on prisoners. Let's cut out their food and all their amenities and we'll save money. Well, that's not true. There's other ways of doing it, like decarceration. Like there's a lot of people in prison, like even the way they present it, you know, murderers, rapists, you know, like not everybody in prison is a murderer or a rapist. There's a lot of different offenses that send you to prison. And to, spend, to, to assume that because you've committed a crime, you need to suffer to a level of is not true. They could decarcerate, get rid of certain offenses, and that would lower the costs. But they don't want to do that because even Harper's crime agenda, part of his getting tough on crime is prison expansion. The government gave $10 billion allocated to, to building new beds in prisons across Canada, even though the crime rate has been steadily going down for the last 10 years because they realize that prison makes money. It makes money on all levels. It makes money on the level of who gets the contracts to build the prisons. It's people they know who they get kickbacks from. It goes to who works in this apparatus, all the people needed to m navigate the whole system. They could easily say, let's cut out a lot of these crimes, let's diminish, and let's put money, instead of putting all our budget in crime prevention, let's put it into schools. Let's get more teachers, let's get more program in schools. They don't choose that. They always spend money on crime prevention and the criminal justice system. If you look at, especially when the agenda is the militarization of everything, it's social control. And we see that in our police, our police are getting more and more militarized. You see that in all facets of the criminal justice system. So this just falls in line with that. They do want to put people in for longer times. You know, the mandatory sentencing I'm going to get to talk about in a bit. So this is their agenda, is to get people in for longer periods of time. The cost, they don't care what they spend. They just come up with stuff like this to sort of it's like a demonization of the prisoner, making people think that things are really being spent on food and amenities and entertainment when really it's just part of the whole apparatus. Wait, so let's Jump say in if, the you guys have any if questions prisons or? were to become private or like completely private. Oh, then, then it would be even so worse. They, can, they could use these figures. Of course. Well, these figures to in order to charge the private companies who are coming. Yes, per they would so pay they, per 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 prisoner. They'd say, okay, we give you one hundred and thirteen thousand dollars per prisoner. So it's worth them to inflate yes. the price. Yeah. yeah, and the price is probably accurate, but the money is going into the the complex of it of paying all the players and to keep it going. You know, okay. as opposed to like being what they actually spend on a prisoner per day is nowhere near three hundred twelve dollars. Like just to say. Per day, every prisoner, a meal, they spend between 550 and six, I think it's 580 per day per prisoner to feed them. Okay, that's not, that's a drop in the bucket from 612, uh, of 312, what they're saying they spend. A lot of it is for all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so basically with the introduction, uh, with, with increased privatization and the introduction of capitalism, yes. they can just charge whatever they want to yes. house these people. Yes. And then with that, if that's part of the government's agenda, then using this information is essentially marketing yeah. for an industry that they want to develop. Exactly. Exactly. It and it's, that's the face they want to present, you know, exactly. And also what this doesn't talk about is the millions and millions of dollars they make on, on prison labor. Yeah. Right? Because I'm going to get into that a bit later. Because they do have Corcan in Canada and they build a lot of stuff and we'll get into that. They make a lot of money that way too. The second thing that really disturbed me about this article is this whole concept of choosing to go to prison. Like I've never heard this before. Like who chooses to go to prison? No one's going to say, I want to go to prison. No. It's that they get caught committing a crime and they get sent to prison. It's against their will usually. It's not something that they choose to do. You know, and this whole assumption that, oh, well, if you commit a crime, it means that you're choosing that you might go to prison. That's not true unless you assume that everybody in prison is guilty and everybody on the street is not, which is not the case. There's many people in prison that aren't guilty and there's many people that are on the street that are guilty. It's not like it's so cut and dry that everybody in prison is guilty, you know? So this whole choice thing I found really bizarre. But I could see an average person who doesn't know anything about prisoner 
prisons or any of this, like reading this and going, oh my gosh, yeah, yeah, you know? So that's what it's for. It's for propaganda. Okay, so. So then he talks about leeching off the, the government to be in prison and all this. People don't choose to give up their freedom. They don't choose to not see their family. They don't choose all this kind of stuff. The government can easily say, we're not going to send people to prison when they commit crimes. We're going to send them to this place, and they're going to do that. Like, they could pick something else. It's not the prisoner's choice. So I, I think this is all goes into, like, this whole propaganda thing, to plant things in people's minds, you know? Then when the, he talks about free health care, recreation, dental and entertainment, education and libraries, I thought this was really humorous because in terms of health care, we all have free health care. If you live in Canada and you're a Canadian citizen, we all could go to the doctor when we're sick. And we usually don't have to pay unless you go for a private plan. I mean, it's not a privilege we're giving to prisoners. It's everybody is in this situation. We have universal health care. So that's kind of you know, misleading. Dental, I thought, was really because dental in prison, it's not like when you're on the outside, if you have medical insurance, you know, you go get a checkup twice a year for teeth cleaning. It's not that. The only time dentists are used is when you're having a problem. If you have an abscess, if you have a, you know, and then you don't get to choose who you see, you go see the prison dentist that's going to decide what's for you. You don't get a second opinion. You don't get any of that. So this whole thing that, you know, wow, I have to pay for my insurance to go to the dentist and they get it free, it's not really the same thing. They, they go in cases of emergency. Education, too, is another one. They've been slowly getting rid of any kind of education in prison. The only thing that remains is high school equivalency. In the 70s, with the boom of reintegration, there was like a left swing in the 70s where they wanted to reintegrate. They came out with all these programs. I did a master's in criminology at Ottawa U, and when I was going, this is a long time ago though, it's 1995. When I was going, I had a guy who was a lifer who would get escorted from a guard who was in my master's class. That would never happen today. They've cut all education beyond high school equivalency. Library, same thing. Libraries in the past, like in the 80s, they had one library in every prison. There was a librarian that was actually paid to work there. They've slowly gotten rid of it. We're now, let's say in Canadian prisons, the library is available two hours, once a week, and it's one of the prisoners that mans the library. So they've really cut out any kind of, you know, permanent library. And entertainment, entertainment, yes, they have TVs, they have cable, they have video games, but this works for the system because it's a pacification device. Like if you can get people to watch TV and whatever, not talk to each other, you quash solidarity and you don't get people. And I talked to a lot of old timers who used to be in jail a long time ago when there was none of that. And they said that was the end of prison solidarity when they brought in TVs and whatever, because that's a device that they use to pacify everyone and to get everybody preoccupied with just playing games or watching television and not talking to each other about what's going on in the prison. Good so far. Is it interesting yeah, or are you finding certainly. it? Certainly. Okay. Okay. Then he talks about linen and furniture, which I thought was also amusing for cells because prison labor, there's a company called Corcan, and that's the main thing they do. They make prison for they make office furniture, they make bedroom furniture, beds, they make textiles, they make they make tanks for the military, they make they make a bunch of stuff and it's a multi-million dollar organization. That's basically prison slave labor because a prisoner gets paid maximum six dollars a day for working an eight-hour shift working in Corcan and everything they produce is either used in the prisons or sold to major companies like I'm sure if you go to office buildings that buy like huge corporations the furniture made is going to be stamped Corcan because it's made in prison so I thought it was funny that he talked about 1.7 million alone going to linen and beds when it's them who are making their own furniture. Um, then 
It talks about the daily menu as being $10. It's not $10, it's five eighty. And he talked about $10 like that's so much money. I don't know, to me, I mean, it's bare minimal. I mean, some people could live on $10 a day, but it's not like it's extravagant, but it's not even 10, it's 580 a day. Um, then this whole, he goes on to say, I didn't read the rest, but the whole point of this is that they're looking at a US model in Connecticut to where prisoners pay for their own keep. So basically, you're put in prison against your will, and then they want you to pay for your keep while you're there. And he talks about it like, wow, what a concept. This would be amazing for Canada when it's already happening in Canada because there was legislation that just came in that talks about this kind of thing, right? And now prisoners pay 30% of their wages goes towards room and board, okay? So they get paid at the maximum job six dollars a day so they work on a five-day schedule times so six times five is 30 so they're basically making sixty dollars every two weeks or 120 a week which they don't get as money they get it on a card which they can use to buy different things right like toiletries that they need and stuff like that but 30 percent is already automatically taken out for room and board already and now they're talking about cutting their salary from $6 to $4.83 a day as the maximum wage. And you gotta remember that a lot of these people, when you work in a prison, you're either working to maintain the prison, so let's say you work in the kitchen, chopping the vegetables, or you mop the offices of the guards and stuff like that. Like you're either maintaining the building or you're working for Corcan. There's no other thing you could be doing. You're either working to make furniture to sell or make textiles or you're working in the prison. So out of that 30% is room and board. $18 a month per prisoner is for Videotron cable. Okay, whether you have a television or not, it gets automatically pulled out of your fund that you're working. So, so I remember when I was at the prison I go to about 10 years ago, there was a guy in there who was like a Buddhist Zen guy who didn't watch television, whatever, and he tried to fight it. He's like, why am I paying $18 when I don't even have a, tele like a television in my cell? And they said, no, that's something that's automatically taken out of their wages to pay for Videotron. So another thing about that too is that they have an exclusivity contract with Videotron. Right, so whenever that happens, there's a kickback to the prison because think about it. If you get Videotron in your home, you're gonna hook up a cable. You might have five TVs and it still costs you one price per month. Okay, so you're paying, if I pay $50, whether I branch it to five TVs or one, I'm still paying $50. Well here, every prisoner, so there's 2,000 prisoners, let's say in a prison, every prisoner is paying $18 a month for Videotron when it's branched in one institution. Right, so that money is being kicked back to the government, you know? So they do stuff like that. So $18 goes to that. Then you think of other expenses they may have. Other stuff they need to pay for that's not supplied, let's say is family phone calls. When you call from a prison, they're not allowed to call you. It has to be on your dime. It has to go through your credit card of what you've worked for. So if you're calling long distance, if you're calling whatever, it comes out of your money. Other things is toiletries. Like some toiletries, the bare minimal is supplied, and actually they brought them to me to show me, which I thought was hilarious. It's like a hotel. It's like this weird type of stuff. Like, like the underarm deodorant was like a round plastic thing that you push the thing through. It was like these round things, and they get one a month, you know? And like it looked like their toothbrush comes in this little like cellophane bag, and it's very minimal, it looks very cheap, whatever. So they get basic but stuff that's not included is let's say good razors because they all talk about how the razors that are supplied you shave once and you can't use it again unless you want to cut your face up so a lot of them buy razors this every two weeks they go to a canteen okay where they there's someone there prisoners that work there that sell stuff and everything you buy gets taken out of your credit card that your wages right if you don't work you get two something a day or something that's put on your credit card. And so they, they buy stuff like shaving cream, 
stamps if they want to write letters home. Like anything that's, a lot of stuff's not included, different types of toiletries, except the essentials. So let's say if you're a prisoner and you do want to eat healthier because you can buy food at the canteen, there's very little money left for that because once you take out the 30% .30 room and board, $18 for Videotron, then you got to buy a call home, all that, there's very little money left to actually buy fresh food. And I'll get into how they order food later, the exclusivity contracts surrounding that. Um, and then he ends off the article talking about mandatory sentencing. I don't know if you know what mandatory sentencing is, but since Harper's government came in, they, they brought in mandatory sentencing. A lot of crimes that you used to commit would have, let's say, a fluctuation of sentence, right? So between two and seven years, depending what it was or whatever, and then it was up to the discretion of the judge after he heard, like at, in, at trial, once he had all his information, he could determine, depending on case to case, what he thought the sentence should be. Well, Harper got rid of that, and now we have mandatory s sentencing, which means if you commit this crime, it's no longer between two and five years. Now it's seven-year minimum, right? So he took the upper <coughs> cut of it and put the minimum as that. And I remember when it came out, judges were going to protest. They were up in arms because they're like, why are we judges then? Just get anybody to say seven years. If we don't have that discretion to decide case to case, why are we here? So it was a big hoopla. So what this has caused is a clogging of the system because people are going in and their sentences are longer, right? So even in Parliament, like when I talked about before, I don't know if you heard any of the debates in Parliament, but when they'd be debating this whole prison expansion, obviously the Liberals and the NDP, not that they're saints, but they would rebut Harper and say, how can you be spending $10 billion on prison expansion when the crime rate's going down, you know? So doing stuff like mandatory sentencing, what it does is it clogs the prisons because people are staying longer and longer and it looks like more people are inside. When before, if you committed an offense and you go in for two years, now you're staying five, five or seven or, you know? So more and more, it looks like more and more people are inside when really it's the sentences that have changed, not criminality, let's say. Okay, so I'm gonna move now into talking about sourcing, food sourcing. I'm gonna to start with the US. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the US, but I'll focus more on Canada and more specifically Quebec. In the US, they, they source their foods like universities, cafeteria stuff. They go to large companies like uh, Chartwell's, Sudexo. These are the same people that you know, cook food for university res, uh, school cafeterias, that kind of thing. The men menu rotates on a monthly basis. And obviously, uh, there's no regulation and no legislation in the US, it's a little worse than here, regarding portion size, uh, the amount of protein or dairy that you need to serve per day. It's usually, it, specific very uh, regulations vary from prison to prison. It's up to the administrators of that prison to dictate what they feel is enough protein, portion size, all that kind of thing. So there's no standardization whatsoever or no minimum level of what do we need to feed to be nutritional at the least, you know? Uh, so it's left to the whims of the administration. There's no conformity. What we see is private prisons are even worse because private prisons, there's more in the US than in Canada. There's some youth detentions in Ontario in Canada. But in the US, there's a lot of private prisons. And the thing with private prisons is like the, 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 the government gives a corporation a certain amount per year per prisoner. And then it's completely up to the corporation to decide how they're gonna, you know, uh, how they're gonna feed them, how many guards. So what you see in a lot of prisons is like guards getting paid $10 an hour you know, being in a pod with 50 prisoners, like it's a much more dangerous situation because they want to keep their costs low, which means they make more profit. So food is the same. They'll skimp out on food because the less they spend, the more the corporation's actually going to pocket in their own pockets. So it becomes really a dangerous situation in private prisons. If, you know, if I'd go to prison, I hope I wouldn't. I would definitely not want to be in a private prison because conditions are much more severe. And we see cases that are brought 
to court sometimes, but they have to be very extreme in the U.S. Like I remember, I don't know if anybody saw this because there's a YouTube thing about it. This was this Alabama sheriff who was caught skimping on portion size and he was pocketing the leftover money, right? And he was arrested at some, because he was basically like starving prisoners, like they were hardly eating anything. And he was arrested, jailed overnight, and then he was released on a promise to stop skimping. You know, and then he did it again, and they brought him in again, and they again, they sort of arrested him, let him stay overnight, and this process goes on. So you see, the court gets involved when it's extreme. And uh, prison uh, in the US, unlike Canada, is prison uh, food is actually used as a form of punishment, okay? Because in Canada, according to our legislation and our constitution, we're not allowed to punish through food or lack of food or type of food, according to our uh, constitution. But in the US, they serve something called neutral loaf. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of neutral loaf. But it's this concoction they come up with that's like this loaf where you don't need any utensils. And it's served to people in segregation, like someone that's committed an act of violence or that has contravened something. But they're put in seg and they're served neutral loaf while they're in seg. And neutral loaf, could be anything. They don't tell you what's in it. They just put whatever that meets the bare minimal like nutritional value to survive and you're fed this while you're in segregation. And it's foul tasting brick basically. You can look it up online. They have pictures of it and stuff if you're interested. And it's give to, given to any prisoner who gets out of line and they use, they use the legitimization that they don't want to give them utensils and they can eat it with their hands. And how foul tasting, depending on the recipe, somewhere between the spectrum, they say from unpleasant to vomit inducing. Like it's really supposed to be very, very disgusting. And many prisoners file suits in the US uh, against prison food, like uh, the, especially this neutral loaf. There was a bunch of cases that went to court for neutral loaf that it's unconstitutional. It's like cruel and unusual punishment and that kind of thing. But, uh, do the courts take these things seriously? Well, they came out with something called the Prison Litigation Reform Act, okay? And this was passed, it was passed in response to Congress's perception, both that inmates were filing frivolous lawsuits regarding their incarceration in terms of food and conditions. So they were being frivolous, they were flooding the system with their complaints. And that a huge, uh, a huge number of the judges are, were activists who were giving in to their complaints. So they came up with this Prison Litigation Reform Act. And uh, as of when this came out, the act requires that a prisoner must prove physical injury before any suit can be filed. And it re so that means that they'd actually have to be poisoned or something, or they'd have to actually so show some kind of documented by a doctor physical injury, let's say related to food, in order for them to exhaust any kind of court proceeding. And even before then, they have to exhaust all administrative remedies before they bring it to court. So it means they have to go through all the channels inside the prison. And only then could they file suit, you know? So imagine what could happen, you know? Like let's say someone's eating something that is really not good for them, they're getting sick all the time. This could take years before it gets to court before they can go see a doctor. Like inside, it's not like outside. People say, oh yeah, they have doctors. Okay, they do have doctors, but let's say if you're ill, it takes a long time to see a doctor. You're on a waiting list and you gotta wait. And I have examples. I knew a guy who had, he kept coughing and coughing and coughing and this chronic cough. And he went to see the doctor, he had to wait to see the doctor, then he'd go see the doctor and the doctor said, oh, it's nothing, you just have a bit of like, uh, you have a cough and stuff, don't worry, it'll go away here, take this cough syrup or whatever. And he did that and he kept coughing and coughing, it was getting worse and worse and he tried to go again and he had to wait a couple of months before he saw the doctor again and then he went to see the doctor and the doctor was like, look, it's just bronchitis, take these pills, right? And even it's a running joke inside because the pills they give are the same pills for anything to anyone. They're all the same kind of pills, you know? So, which makes you question pharmaceutical companies and what are they getting for prisoners, you know? But, so whatever, this went on, went on, and it went on for a year and a half till he was coughing up blood, okay? And finally, he went to see, he did an actual, he, you have to, you can fill like a petition to go see an outside 
doctor, right? But it takes time. It has to go through all the channels. So he did this. It took a couple of more months to go see an outside doctor, and he had advanced throat cancer. So he had to go through chemotherapy and ra I mean, he's okay now. He talks like this, but he's okay. Like they have to remove part of his whatever. And he's okay for now, but like just to show you how when people say, oh, but they do have doctors and there is medical care inside and whatever, it's not anywhere near what we have the privilege of having on the outside. And oftentimes who they hire inside are very shoddy doctors. Like I know in the US, remember like 15 years ago, they came out with an article where one of the prisons in the US actually had a veterinarian as a doctor. It wasn't even like a certified medical doctor for people, you know? So you got a question. It's not as easy to navigate the system when you're dealing with this kind of thing. Let's say if you are getting ill. So in the U.S., this Prison Litigation Reform Act was really a step backwards. And it caused like a lot of people, it's very hard to push through complaints for anything that happens in prison. What we see, so... Um, there are no laws also governing food inside except for the Eighth Amendment in the U.S. Uh, amendment ban on cruel and unusual punishment. And or the First Amendment regarding freedom of religion. So you're allowed, like in the U.S., you're allowed vegetarian or kosher meals, but you have to prove your religion. It can't just be optional. Maybe some prisons navigate it that way, but you can't just say... I just want to be a vegetarian. I don't believe in eating. That's not good enough. It has to be like either a religious or like an intolerance, which would need a lot of medical support, that kind of thing. So what do we see in Canada? Like I said before, I'm speaking a little bit law and a little bit from a personal perspective of going inside for 15 years and hearing stories for 15 years and getting the menus that are served there and how they navigate where I go. And Quebec, a lot of it is the same. So I'll be coming from that perspective. But you got to think that even though every prison is different, they follow the same kind of model. So in Canada, they no longer use large, corp large corporations like in the U.S., like Sudexu and uh, Chartwell, stuff like that, like they once did. They stopped doing that about 10 years ago, 5 to 10 years ago. They use smaller corporations that are more local. I don't mean local like our local farmer, but I mean in Quebec, let's say. If we live in Quebec, we're gonna try to get our stuff from companies in Quebec. Um, so smaller corporations deliver food to prisoners through contracts pertaining to different food groups. So you'll see like someone delivers the dairy. There's a company for that. There's a meat company that brings in the meat. There's a produce company that brings in the produce. There's a non-perishable company that delivers all the non-perishable food. There's a budget that's allocated for food, which like I said before, they average it out to it's about $5.80 per, per, per prisoner per day. And, uh, and basically, it's the prisons themselves who decide what to spend it on. So it's not like they have a criteria where they have to spend... 50% on protein or they have to spend no it's up to the prison to decide what they spend it on except for milk because milk is from Agropur and there's an exclusivity contract in Canada that they only get their milk from Agropur okay so that has been institutionalized into the menu where every guy gets three milks a day whether he drinks milk or not because they have that exclusivity contract with Agropur so it ends up being that 20% of the budget of the 580 is spent on milk because of this exclusivity contract. The only thing they say, Correctional Services Canada, is they try to follow, follow the Canada Food Guide when they're planning meals. I have here uh, examples of a monthly menu. If anybody's interested, I'll just leave it there. Right? It rotates on a monthly basis by week. And it looks and, you know, it says how many grams of everything is in there. Uh, so, like I said, in Quebec, dairy comes from, from Agripur. The bread comes from Boulangerie Gadoua. The meat comes from Alme Plus. So that's where they get their basic stuff in Quebec. Apart from sourcing food, some prisons have a greenhouse where they grow produce that's put back into the meals. Uh, and grow plants that they decorate the prison with. Um, 
so like I said, it says anywhere uh, there's a tight budget for food, and the average cost is five thirty to five eighty a day, depending on where you are. And twenty percent of that is milk, three milks a day, whether you drink it or not. So that's you see another exclusivity thing, like Videotron. All institutions order their milk from Agripro, and they have to order a minimal amount. That's why everybody gets three a day. There's another thing like that is Sears is another company that has an exclusivity contract with prisons because if your family has money, because if you don't, then well, they don't, so you don't get anything. They're allowed to put $500 a year into a fund for you to order clothing only if they can afford it. If you, do, if you don't have a family that doesn't have money, well, you can, but if they do, and this $500 has to be spent at Sears in a Sears catalog. And oftentimes these catalogs don't have sales. It's like regular price. So a coat that you can go to Village Valor and get for $20, you're gonna be paying $300 at Sears. So it's this exclusivity contract that if you're in a prison, you have to order from them because the prison has an accord with Sears. Um, also, certain more expensive, let's say in prison in terms of their menu, certain more expensive cuts are never served, like bacon, let's say. They'll never get bacon because it's too expensive. Um, a lot of their produce is uh, very minimal. There's less ve fresh vegetables. What you'll see, in, they say a lot of starch, a lot of like powdered mashed potatoes, let's say, that kind of thing. That That is canned vegetables. Like a lot of the fresh stuff is very minimal. <clears throat> Especially in the winter because in the summer at least they have the greenhouse that grows a bit of the stuff so they might get fruit if they have figs or if they have whatever because fruit is very very minimal. Um, so let's say a prisoner doesn't want to eat in the cafeteria. They want to eat healthier. What are their options? They could purchase their own food like I said through the canteen every two weeks because every prison has one communal kitchen usually in every pot. So let's say you're staying in that range, there'll be a kitchen that the, everybody could share to use to cook for themselves if they don't want to eat at the cafeteria. Um, they make their purchases at the canteen, that two week canteen where they buy their toiletries and all that kind of thing with their credit card that they have, uh, depending if they have any money. Now a lot of guys have a lot more money because they, they smoking is no longer allowed in prisons because before they'd have to spend money for cigarettes so a lot of their money would go towards that they'd buy cigarettes at the canteen but now cigarettes have become illegal so it opens up a bit of money for produce and fresh meat so they'll go and basically the way it works where i go is that they order every two weeks from a rotating system from provigo iga and metro that is nearby, right? So first first time they go, they'll get Provigo. They'll have their price list and they have a certain amount of items that they make available, like a chicken breast, uh, you know, but never on sale. There's never sales like our circulars when we look at circulars and say this week, let me go get drumsticks, they're $1.99. It's full price. And then two weeks later will be IGA and the two weeks after that will be Metro. And the thing with that is that the whole system usually is navigated usually by the guards. So any extra money that they're making, let's say if things are on sale, the catalog will say chicken breasts are you know uh, eight ninety nine a pound. But this week there's a sale on chicken breasts for three ninety nine a pound. Well, that extra that they're making from the guys paying for eight ninety nine a pound goes into their guard fund, right? So. It funnels in through the guard fund. It's a guard fund. Well, they have a fund for like Christmas parties, uh, you know, stuff like that. Paying union fees, that kind of thing. Um, in the summer, it's better for prisoners because some of them could grow. They, there's garden plots. They're limited though, so not every prisoner gets them, but sometimes they'll group together and at least they have fresh produce that they grow themselves. They just have to buy their seeds through the institution, which I'm sure are Monsanto seeds. But uh, anyway, so they'll pay for seeds and they'll grow their own garden. And a lot of people that I know 
that I go inside with. They have beautiful gardens in the summer and they grow all kinds of stuff. So summer's a good time. The bad thing is that there's no storage, so they can't freeze for the winter. There's no fridge that they can free freeze or they can freeze in. So it's just for summer. So they eat. for the ones that are concerned with their health, they eat a lot better in the summer because they grow their own vegetables and get to incorporate fresh produce into their meals. And what some of them will do is like they'll go to the cafeteria, they'll see what's there, they'll say, okay, the meat looks okay this time. I'll take the meat, but I won't take anything else. And they'll put the meat in the fridge and they'll cut it up and they'll reconstitute it and refry it with fresh vegetables that they buy all together communally on the range or five guys. You know, one chicken breast is $8.99 a pound. They don't, they're working with very minimal money. You gotta think, they don't have much money once they phone calls and everything's left. So they'll say, let's four of us chip in on this one chicken breast and we'll cut it up and we'll add vegetables, whatever, and we'll eat together. So a lot of them, so it's like a community thing, which is a nice thing out of necessity. And before in Canada, like years ago, there actually used to be farming across Canada and they've taken all of that out. There's no more farming on prisons, in prison. And a lot of the guys would man the farms and work on the farms, and, but they've gotten rid of all that. And they contract out to now industrial food processes, like everything comes in from outside, except for small greenhouses. So I did a little poll like, of prisoners that I knew, just to say like, what do you think of the food? Like, how's your food, you know? Like, so they said, you know, could be worse, I guess, not bread and water, but they're saying that usually it's greasy, bland, there's a lot of filler, very little meat and a lot of starch like they have french fries two to four times a week for sure like those frozen french fries and they say that usually when they uh, the the better stuff comes in very small portion and the bad stuff comes in very big portion you know so that was their riff on it and the way the meals are cooked is a problem too i know maybe some cafeterias and nursing homes have the same kind of thing but the way it works in prison is that in the kitchen, you have stewards that are hired externally. There's like a manager that's hired externally to run the kitchen. And then all the prisoners work inside the kitchen. In the past, this was a prime job to have. They used to fight over these positions because there was actual training involved, like of how to run a kitchen, how to cook, how to order food. They were involved in all the process. You require a skill. Yes. So they require a skill that when they got out of prison, they can get jobs in a, you know, in a, you know, a kitchen. They'd have to be certified in first aid. They'd have to have all that kind of stuff because it was basically them being trained in the trade of working in a kitchen. Well, they've gotten rid of all that. Now they just hire stewards who run the whole thing. And the guys who work in the kitchen basically are just like manual labor. Like they're told, chop this go wash dishes, whatever. There's no training at all that's involved anymore. So it's lost status. It's not the sought out job. Now what's sought out, because they've done this with a lot of things, because they used to have a lot more training programs before and they've cut a lot of it out, except if you're working for Corcan and they need a welder, well then they'll show you how to weld because that's making millions of dollars because you're selling this stuff to other companies. You know, so then there might be a bit of an investment in showing you, but otherwise, whatever takes the maintenance, like mechanics used to be a big thing of the past, learning mechanics, that kind of thing, that's all been got. Drafting, like I know some people that got out a while ago, like 15 years ago, and they were trained as drafts, they drafting, and that's what they do for a living now when they got out, you know? But that's all been gone. Now it's more menial stuff. So if you work in the kitchen, now it's not a coveted position because they're the longest shifts and you're only getting paid $6 a day, well, it's gonna go to 483 soon, but that's the maximum. So people would ra like, people inside would rather have a job like mopping because you're working four hours a day instead of eight. You know, the kitchen is longer hours with little return because you're not getting that training. So how it works is sort of like, meals are made hours in advance. So let's say it's breakfast. So they make breakfast, they eat at seven o'clock. Right after breakfast, they start cooking lunch. Lunch is ready by 9.30, and what they do is they put it in those plug-in warmers till 11.30, till they serve. So it's been sitting for two hours in a warmer. Then they eat right after lunch, whatever, they start cooking supper. Supper goes into the warmers at 2.30, and supper is served at 5. So the food is like sitting for two and a half hours in these plug-in warmers, you know? 
because that fits better with hiring stewards because you have to pay the stewards in the kitchen, you know? So that's, so the food is often not very good, overcooked, mushy, that kind of thing because of this process. Okay. Another thing that's interesting where I come from, the prison that I go to is that the vending machines because twice a week you can get visitors coming to visit you, your family and there's a family, like there's a visitor room where they go to where they have vending machine with chips and you know, coke and junk food basically. And every family, every family going in is allowed to bring $10 in change to buy junk food during the meeting for them and their loved one or whatever. Well, those machines are manned by the guards. So they fill them and they make all the profit. So it's like they're profiting off family members. It's not a company that comes in. It's done internally within the prison. And all the money that's collected there goes to the guard fund, which is for the holiday, the Christmas party, stuff like that, you know? Um, Canada is sort of the same like the US regarding litigation. It's very hard to get a complaint across. They have to exhaust all channels administratively within their own prison before going to the courts. That means filing grievances at different levels of CSC, Correctional Services of Canada, which could take months to process until you appeal. You have to appeal it to the level of the administrators in Ard, Ottawa, who will make a decision. That's the, the channel. It goes to Ottawa. Then if you don't agree with their decision, only then can you bring it to like a court of law to counter the appeal. This process takes years while you're still having the same issue you have that made you lodge the complaint in the first place. So it takes years before all of this is sorted out. Were you going to ask something? No. Okay. Any questions? about the process. <clears throat> when you talk about the guard fund, um, if they have like a Christmas party, that's strictly among the guards, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's their guard Christmas party. Extra. But this is how they get extra money for it, is like yeah. the families feed into these machines and feed junk food to their whatever, and they're, they're the ones who fill them, they're the ones who empty the money, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Which you think would be a conflict of interest, it would be something weird. I don't know why they would allow that kind of thing. It's kind of weird to me. How you're profiting off family being guards you know you're not the state you're like workers okay so now I'm going to talk a little bit about how does the law interact or not with prison food right we talked a little bit about laws so in the US adequate food is one of the minimal essentials held by the Eighth Amendment against cruel and unusual punishment this actually went to court because I don't know if there's a book called Cruel and Unusual Punishment. It's about solitary confinement, like how people were kept in solitary confinement for years, being fed very minimally and all this, and there was a huge court case, and now there's this clause against cruel and unusual punishment. So food receives more protection than any other inmate provision. They, so they're not allowed to not feed prisoners, right? So they can't say, today you're not eating because you did this, but they could feed them neutral loaf, let's say. They can use the food as some kind of form of punishment, but they can't not feed prisoners. In Canada, prisons are regulated the same way any kind of collective kitchen is, a cafeteria, a kitchen in a nursing home, any industrial type kitchen that has industrial food processes. So let's say the manager has to be certified in MAPAC, which is kitchen safety. They have to have all their kitchen permits. Uh, they have to know how to store everything in a safe way. But the only difference is, is unlike restaurants, collective kitchens, nursing homes, that kind of thing, which are inspected on a regular basis. Let's say if you have a restaurant or even at the, the potato, you know, we get an inspector coming in once a year to make sure that we're up to code with everything. Prisons are rarely inspected. They don't send inspectors to go check kitchens. So. The only way that they usually get sent, if there's some kind of outbreak related to some kind of food related illness, let's say they poisoned a bunch of people, then the inspectors would come in to check. But besides that, inspections are very rare. Uh, so it leads to like sanitation issues too. Like industrial food processes in general, unsafe in the sense that food contamination happens on a large scale, right? If we have something that's whatever, we're poisoning a bunch of people regardless when it's industrial. But other things like cafeterias, nursing home, are more intensely regulated. 
So you have people going in more often, checking, that kind of thing. Inspectors, uh, like I said before, testing temperature compliance, food disposal, that kind of thing. Uh, even though prisons are subject to the same regulations, they're not thoroughly inspected. So the, the chance of contamination is much higher than in other industrial food processes. Um, okay, and special diets. That's the way. How does the law interact with special diets? Let's say I talked a little bit about religious. Let's say in Canada, uh, religious food limitations are accepted if a prisoner can prove their religion, that they practice a certain religion. Prove your religion. Well, let's say if you're, uh, if you're, uh, I don't know, uh, you're Buddhist and they see you meditating all okay. the time, or if you're, you know, you know what I mean? So, yeah. but you have to sort of prove, it can't be, I don't like meat, I'm not gonna eat meat. It's sort of like, if you're gonna do that, go that route, if you're a prisoner, you sort of have to lie and make it look like it's some kind of either food intolerance, or it's a special diet because of a religion, because it goes back to the constitution, freedom of religion. Mm. Um, so, but let's say you have a health-related limitation, like let's say you have celiac disease, you can't eat wheat. That would be a nightmare in prison because you have to prove it medically, like through a doctor, right? And I talked about before how long it takes to see a doctor. Like, you know, it takes to tell you, the guy had throat cancer and he can hardly get an appointment inside. You know, imagine I say, well, I'm getting a stomach ache when I eat. Can I go see a doctor? Well, then I'm put on a waiting list to go see a doctor. And then are the appropriate tests going to be done? And are they whatever? So all that time, though, I don't really, if I want to eat, a lot of it is starch, I'm, I'm, there's a lot of filler and a lot of food, I'm going to be stuck eating wheat and being sick till it gets regulated. Um, any questions about that? I'm going to go into a bit of, talk a little bit about food and prison resistance, using food as a form of resistance, whether it's be it by not eating or by eating differently or by using food in a different way, getting creative to sort of gain some kind of control. Because when you're in prison, you have very little control over anything. Your freedom is taken away and there's people controlling you. And prisoners find ways where they kind of regain their control through food. So the most obvious is hunger strikes. I'm sure you guys have heard of all the hunger strikes that were going on in the US last year. Hunger strikes happen a lot. Uh, especially recently in the US and it was a call against like prison conditions let's say double bunking or uh, you know segregation stuff like that so what they'll do is a bunch of prisoners will get together and say we're not gonna eat we're not just not gonna eat till we die if we have to as a way of trying to pressure the government or pressure the pressure the prison prison to increase uh, to get rid of what's going on to make the conditions better. Because like I said, that Prison Litigation Reform Act makes it very difficult to go to court, unless whatever. So this is another form of regaining control. And some people have died. I mean, throughout the years and centuries, like in Ireland, whatever, the, like food strikes have always existed in prison as a way of regaining control and pushing demands. In women's prisons, it's a little bit different. We see a trend, not that there's never f hunger strikes, but, um, Eating disorders has not eating as a way of gaining some form of control, not as a uh, making a demand type thing, but having control of my own body and refusing to eat what they give me. So then it leads to like a, I could become anorexic, I could become bulimic, whatever, but it's this whole idea of taking the food and using it as a way to make yourself feel better, having more control because they can't force you to eat. Unless like you're, when you're on a hunger strike and you're almost, they will like take you and give you an IV and forcibly knock you out and, you know, but generally they can't really force feed you. So that's a way women feel more empowered that they have some sense of control by deciding not to ingest food. Um, so what their accounts reveal is how food is not only experienced pun punitively in this context, but also how dietary behaviors are woven into the strategies through which they cope with and resist the pains of imprisonment. 
So the findings highlight issues of power and control in women's prisons. No matter how much prison authorities try to control them, women prisoners still manage to resist through lack of food, their limited choices and opportunities. Um, another way prisoners gain control is they refuse to, refuse to eat in the cafeteria. Like some will do whatever they have to, they'll eat less than they should, and they just refuse to eat the prison food. They'll only eat what they can afford to eat, and if they can't, they just won't eat. Because for them it's a sign of not giving in to bad food and not giving in to ingesting what they're being given. And you see historically, like food issues have historically led to resistance for bigger things. Like I said, food hunger strikes. Like Albany, there was an Albany prison protest where constant orchestrated complaining by prisoners, refusal to eat an act of protest did achieve certain ends of making the prison situation better. Uh, it led to a provision of alternative meals and to transfer the transfer of two catering officers out of the line because it was two catering officers that were really making the food disgusting and were really toying with the whole process and they managed to get them out of there through these protests refusing to eat and active protests like throwing things, throwing their food, that kind of thing. Uh, and that's actually if you look at the history of prison because of these kind of incidents where throwing food and that kind of thing communal dining halls in men's prisons have been taken out of use now it's cafeteria style um, I think that's about it um, I think it's important I just want to end by saying that I think it's important to look at prisons I know that industrial food processes are a problem everywhere and it's become part of our culture where we get bad food and we get GMO food and we get all this kind of stuff and it's really hard to stay away from all that kind of government regulation that is, let it, is polluting our bodies with this bad quality of food. Um, but looking at prison is important because I see the prison as like a microcosm of society. Like you go anywhere <coughs> in the world and by looking at what's going on in prison is going to highlight at mo in a more extreme way though because it's at its most extreme where that society is going and looking at food in this in, in prisons is indicative of what's going on on the outside but more on a more extreme level what we're seeing is more and more industrialized processed food in institutions and now streaming into our everyday lives and I'm gonna end it there I don't know if you have any questions or. <laughs> so yeah, we could just chat. I mean, we're still, you know, have some time. So if you got, if you want to chat, we can. It seems to me that at the root of the problem is that, well, there's a there's a few different things that are happening, but it's that everything is being reduced to a very like mechanical understanding of what should be put into us and like many people are very like out on the outside are very closely connected to our food it's a social experience it's a spiritual experience it's it's a it involves a lot of autonomy and choice mm -hmm. and it's it's something very fundamental i mean it equates to life well, i agree directly yeah and introducing uh free market capitalism to it just further carries this like reductionist approach to the food and this uh, misunderstanding of who inmates truly are as individuals and um, it, it, it looks like it will be very tough to, do, to take the steps needed to uh, reintroduce um, what I see as the bigger solutions which would be prison farms and more greenhouse like operations. I think that this will more closely connect them with their food. It will give them skills. It will, you know, it calms people to, to garden and to plant like quite a bit. This is very good for your mind. Mm -hmm. um, but this is directly at odds with the way prisons are going and with privatization and industrialization. Definitely, because that's not their aim. Their aim is not, like you can't, <coughs> the assumption has to be that they're not well-intentioned because they're not, yes. okay? Like if they were well-intentioned, things would not be going this way. Okay, we gotta, the pr like, even we can talk very meta, 
like uh, get in on a bigger level but I mean if you look at society I mean you know there's not enough jobs for everyone there's a surplus population that you don't know what to do with and what do you do? Well, you incriminate them and you put them in prison. Like even laws are not absolutes, they're created. Mm -hmm. And we p focus on property law, and we focus on certain things more than others, you mm -hmm. know? But I do think that, you know, what are you gonna do with these people? So you pick certain people, you know, mm -hmm. people of color, Aboriginal, mm -hmm. like, you know, mm -hmm. there's certain ones that are more likely, you know, socially profiling people, whatever. And these are yeah. the people that are gonna end up inside because ending up inside, I believe, but people may disagree. All it comes down to is how much can you afford to pay a lawyer? That's all it yeah. comes down to. Doesn't matter whether you're innocent, you're guilty, it's about your social status and how much can you afford. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, the, the system has shown to be a crock, that it doesn't mm -hmm. put people that are, you know, and, it, and we, we don't have, we have a view of like, oh, they've done wrong, put them away. Just like this article, you know, it's like, it's like pinpointing prisoners at bad apples. They did this, they go in there, and now we're gonna pay for them. Well, you know, people go to prison because some laws are created uh, at the expense of certain people, because we focus on that. Mm -hmm. And some people go to prison because they don't have the same advantages as other people. There's a million different reasons why people go to prison. Mm -hmm. They have a bad lawyer, they have a, you know. Yeah. So I think it goes in line, they need prisons, they need somewhere to house people. Prisons do make money. It mm -hmm. keeps the social apparatus going of the criminal justice system. Like I said, you could look at any society, a Western, okay, I'm not talking, but you'll look at most places and whenever they cut a budget, it's never gonna be in criminal justice, never. Mm -hmm. That only increases. Like you look even in Canada, in the last whatever, they cut healthcare, they cut education, they cut, they're never. What they did is, with the student strikes, they spent millions and millions getting cops from all over Quebec and all over yeah. to come and pacify students that don't wanna pay extra tuition, you know? So they'll always invest in that, but then they'll have articles like this saying, we have no more money, we're spending all our money on, it's just mismanagement of funds and where they wanna allocate their money. So they're not well-intentioned, they don't care. No. What they want to do is present a picture, a picture of prisoners a certain way, and because it's a hidden thing, you don't get much information. It's not easy easy to access prison information and see what's actually going it's on. It's considered but taboo as well. Yeah. But it's, it's also like, for me, like, I find it's also like a means of controlling a society. It like is. You have this like prison system, so if you have these students that are going to go and protest, you're not, you know, like I've met even people here that would say like, oh, but I'm afraid, like, what if I get arrested? So so you have the system in place. Exactly, to, to pacify you know, people, to, yeah. To, like, keep the system going as yeah. it is. It's like, shut up and move yeah. on. You yeah. know, you're not supposed to question anything. Yeah, you're not supposed to. And they don't want to cut things. Like, they'd rather just pay corporations to bring in stuff. It's <clears> easier <throat> for them than have farming. Yeah. Because they're not trying to save money. It's not about that, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, even Harper, 10 billion, he went over budget with 10 billion expanding and he hired his friends to do the prison because yeah. his buddy is the prison expansion king of the US yeah. you know and even though the US are now in a state of crisis they're decarcerating and they've put moratoriums on building prisons in California whatever just because there's a prison on every corner like they've gone crazy where like all this populations inside Harper still keeps doing what he's doing because it's profitable and it makes yeah. money that's I think part of the shame of it is that the same people who are denouncing these individuals yeah. for, for the circumstances that were bestowed upon them or that they were involved in. Yeah. These these denouncers are so quick to turn around and, and they're quite happy to pocket quite a bit of substantial money off exactly. something that obviously should not be celebrated and by exactly. profiting it's almost comparable to celebrating it because they yeah. see it as a good opportunity. Definitely. Something where they want to benefit off of somebody else's, many people's mm -hmm. loss. And I get what you said about the food, it's true, it comes down to like, you know, having access to anything, any time, any time of the year, any hour, mm -hmm. you know, it's very, like we can get broccoli at any time of the year, we can get this, and it's all like this mm -hmm. crappy stuff that comes <coughs> from God knows where to here, mm -hmm. that's been injected with whatever, and, you know. Mm -hmm. So are there like specific, like demands, or like? For who? 
that the that the prisoners have that, that well they they'd would like, like more fresh produce and I mean it's all relative right like we yeah. complain about the produce where we get right because mm -hmm. ours is injected they all look perfectly the same and they're GMO whatever well I think they'd want GMO they just want produce yeah. and then you know so it depends yeah you know like the it's not a lot of people don't eat in the cafeteria or they eat partially in the cafeteria mm -hmm. like I said. Yep. Like the people that I know, especially if they're concerned with health stuff, there's some healthy people that work out and whatever, and mm -hmm. they do what I said. They try to just cut corners and do, they'll go, they'll grab a little piece of meat. If it looks okay, they'll cut up into pieces, they'll buy vegetables, they'll stir fry it themselves, they'll share it. And, you know, so they mitigate it in a certain way. But if you were to eat that menu all the time, it's not very good or healthy. I don't know if you looked at it, but it's like yeah, this. It and it's on a four, it, they get it that like every good. week, it repeats, so that's it. So no, they're not, you know, they couldn't be eating healthier. Why don't they grow their own stuff, have farms, like you said. And, this, you is know. All, this seems to me to be a, uh, an obvious idea, right? Yeah. All of this time that they could be, that they're, all this money that they're paying to watch TV, why could this money not be streamed into, into greenhouses and farming? Like this is so, they keep it's so good pacified. for like things like depression and things like this. Like, Gardening this is so, such a wonderful thing to do and like this is where society in general needs to move towards mm -hmm. is growing their own food mm -hmm. And this is I mean, it's a great skill to build as well mm -hmm. on so many scales That's Especially it, farming they won't too, do right? it Because they want you playing video games and watching TV and shutting up and not getting together with your guy in the next cell who has the same complaints as you so you don't rally together against some you mm -hmm. know like it's a pacification yes. it's a pacifying device yeah but to keep you quiet. Yeah, and I mean, in in there's many forms of pacification, and like TV will pacify you from critical thinking just because exactly. you're being stimulated. Yeah. But it, but uh, there are benefits to pacification from like violence, like you know, in this pacifist pacifist understanding mm -hmm. that I think would be quite like if people were able to grow and be mm -hmm. in control of their own food and mm -hmm. exercise some autonomy. This pacifies Definitely. people just from you know negative expressions and outbursts. Yeah. I think it's definitely a, it's a moral scandal that they don't it right? is. Yeah. but they won't but it'll also be a skill it'd be like something exactly. that's like that'll be like that's rehabilitating something yeah like that's that it but then when they get out there's uh, already not enough jobs right so we're gonna give it to them we should keep them like when you leave prison you literally leave they give you your bag and they say bye like that's how it is right yeah and they go to a halfway or whatever but it's like it's not like they prepare you for much or give yeah. you any kind of resources and e even, to get out. even if you do generate some skills, it comes back to this discrimination where like who gets to be in the privilege of like being considered someone who knows. And yes. Like exactly. the privilege knower. Like yes. you're discredited you, automatically. You might know how to well, but you don't have the certification, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, thank you very much. No problem. I'm glad you came. <laughs> I'm glad I came too. And you're listening. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I was here. Was okay. And I missed, like, what's the, big, what's the name of the workshop? And, and it's, uh, do we have the flyer? F food politics and the prison system. Yeah, food politics and industrial food processes. Yeah. It's a shame that this yeah. type of knowledge doesn't generate yeah. money because then you would have tons of people here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, but you know what? On a, Just on a level, like, uh, it's disappointing, but many people are not interested in prison stuff. No. And that's normal because we're s told that's the worst of the worst. And, you know, you always have this, uh, you know what I mean? Like this, yeah, this indoctrination thing that unless you're, you know, mm -hmm. in it or exposed to it or, you know, you're going to think, why would I waste my time like on prisoners when there's so many other causes, uh, you know? Yeah. So, uh, you know. And maybe it wasn't advertised as much as we could. Yeah. Where did you see it? I Just saw it on the seventh floor of the hall building. Okay, yeah. Outside the potato or yeah. something? Yeah. And uh, I actually showed up at QPerg. Yeah. And they didn't know where it was. And they're like, oh, it's probably at the People's Potato. You should go there. And okay. I looked, because uh, I, I always take pictures of the flyers. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, good. Like, so I and looked and it said Suite here. 404. And I was like, oh, okay. So I guess that's upstairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never yeah, been yeah. here in my life. But that's it. There wasn't enough advertising. I just don't under don't know if people are interested in that kind of thing. People are. I think that I don't know if you reached out to yeah. different groups on Concordia, but you know if you had talked to the student union or yeah. the food coalition. Yeah. I think that this would be important.